Clara, I cannot change the laws of physics. I've got to have at least 42 minutes to turn the Dalek good and stop the radiation. Sure you can, Doctor. Just use the Jeffreys tubes. Oh, aye. That'd be a wee bit better then. I'll have her kicking in time for a pint. Welcome everyone to episode 70 of an unearthly podcast. We're recording live on September 3, 2014 and featuring the latest episode of Doctor Who, Into the Dalek. I am Bill Sylvia, the man in black, and with me are Mad Matt Winchell. Hello. Randy Ronston McCulloch. Always a pleasure. Aaron Romeo Moon Burke. Hello. And Tim the Enchanter Sheridan. Ooby dooby. So, uh, before we kick into all of our uh, various uh, deep breath related news, unfortunately, uh, our uh, Lost Stories segment has returned. Uh, it's actually very timely for me because uh, at the uh, GeekCon, which uh, you might remember was our, where we had our last episode that was not live, well, was physically live, but not online live, I watched uh, the episode he featured in and. Thank you, Internet. Uh, and uh, Bill Kerr, who played uh, Giles Kent in Enemy of the World, uh, recently passed at the age of 92. So, fairly that's decent a good run. run. That's a good run plus a decade. Yeah. Um, does it say why? I'm not sure. Doesn't seem to say why. I guess, yeah, it I guess say he, why. I, I guess I guess he was holding off until his episode hit DVD, <clears throat> and uh, when that happened last year, he you know he had what he needed to go on. Apparently. Yeah, it's nothing I can see. Of course, at ninety-two, they sometimes don't bother to give you the the reason for death, just natural causes. <sighs> yeah, he he died at his home, so he wasn't hospitalized or anything like that. So it was probably natural causes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, from here we have a string of deep breath related articles uh, generally uh, viewing figures and such so we'll uh, run through those as quickly as we can because I don't think there's anything hugely interesting in how many people watch deep breath but it is uh, news worth talking about mm -hmm. so we'll uh, discuss that for a bit uh, UK final figures is 9.17 million. I think it was at 7.8 after the first showing, and that's including the uh, the second uh, showing later that night. Okay, so everyone who watched the sh everyone who watched the show on BBC One within the first week of transmission. Okay, and it's uh, noting that it was the second highest show that week after the Great British Bake Off. <laughs> and it was so it lost to a cooking show. Apparently, it was also the uh, the most watched Doctor Who episode, not counting Christmas specials or fiftieth anniversary specials, since the previous Doctor's debut episode. So that pretty much shows uh, what types of episodes people like to watch. Well, Apparently. yeah, you're <laughs> always wondering what the new Doctor is going to be like. Yeah. Even if you aren't a regular watcher of the show, it's still a matter of, you know, I wonder, you know, how he's going to act. And there's been a lot of speculation about how Capaldi would be acting because, you know, what he's done in previous works has been so not doctory. And And we're still kind of wondering well, what he'll throw at us next because he's been kind of an odd doctor. Yeah, I was gonna say if, if I'm gonna say de depending on how you go off of, depending on how many doctors back you're willing to go, it could be argued that his uh, current role is acting not particularly doctory either. But there's a precedent for that. Yes, yes, there is. 
There's a couple of presidents for that. True. Uh, so, I, yes, um, let's see, trying to look at the figures we've got, um, oh, there's just some smaller figures of later in the week showings rather than anything, any of the big ones. Yeah, they expect I expect you to read all the articles, but I figured just to go with the final article rather than every single UK writing article. Um, yeah. I'm pretty sure it was something like 7.8 million for the first uh, then there was an then there was an overnight which had its own ratings and then several uh, encores from there throughout the week. Mm -hmm. The, ma That's the majority of it came from from Saturday. Gotta see first. All right, so let's uh, go back to the United go... States. Yep. <coughs> Come on, internet. Thank you, internet. <coughs> Uh, the United States had 2.6 million, so significantly lower, but it uh, hasn't had as huge of a U.S. impact as of yet, but it's definitely, you know, getting there. Well, also, you know, you got to look at the fact that, the, that in the U.K., this is on BBC One. It's, you know, basically the big network. I don't um, think the U.S. has one of those anymore. Technically, you know, the comparison would be if this had been airing on CBS or NBC or ABC, something like that. Uh, um, as do opposed people still to, watch those? Some people do. Um, like like everything I know of that, everything I ever hear of people talking about watching something on, it's either what on HBO, on uh, CW. Or Fox. Well, or you know, there are occasionally, I mean, um, Gotham is going to be coming out, I think, on NBC, I think. Yeah. So I'm actually That's going to be watching networks for that. Uh, or... During the premiere on Saturday, which uh, was watched by 2.2 million, Doctor Who was the most watched show on cable. So, okay, so maybe it was Za. big news. So that just shows how uh, how much of a distribution American cable channels have. I mean, granted, I know the channels Randy mentioned I don't think might are considered cable, so that might skew things as well. I'm not depending on whether they're specifically talking cable channels or in general. They're yeah. talking when they say on cable, they mean anything, any non-network television. So not CBS, NBC. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Oh, I thought so. Wait, yeah, I don't... Not CBS, NBC, I don't ABC, Fox, too. CW, or PBS. Yeah. Right, They're yeah, talking so channels being, like this, CFI, yeah. Hub, HBO, maybe, and maybe a couple of others. And this is also, it says, the biggest premiere that they've ever had on BBC America. Now, I watch Stop. a lot of BBC America now. And BBC America is basically three shows. It has a few well, other shows. The last equivalent premiere, they're probably they're talking about the eleventh hour, right? Yes. Yeah. So, and I think by that point, Doc, yeah. So it makes sense that the American audience has grown hugely in the past four years for Doctor Who. And we have, and we know what? that close, and we know that close to two thousand people that wanted to see it couldn't because they were at a convention in Middleton. <laughs> yeah. Thousand of them. <clears throat> only. Well, I'm pretty sure not the whole only, three thousand, but I'm willing to bet about half of them did. Only, only one million of those viewers would, were uh, were adults between ages twenty five and fifty four. Hmm. That that number surprises me compared to you know compared to the two point two. How do they know that? that? Um. They're doing a demographics, probably. Actually, I don't know how they know that. Yeah, I think that's kind of rubbish. That's pulling numbers um, out of the butt. Do, they, well, I think, do I, they do the boxes? I think I think that goes off when you you know when you get cable. You I think you check off how many people are in the household of what ages for the sake of ratings. Yeah, I was gonna say maybe. if they know, know how many how old people are in the household, maybe. Yeah. And I'm wondering, you know. I know they can get these numbers. Is how how much how many people also wound up DVRing it? 
I think, yeah, these numbers still usually don't include the DVR, which is something that has plagued Doctor Who since 1996. Yep. Uh, they said that uh, the UK ratings are at least, uh, this is the final ratings, which is not, which is different and more reliable than the overnight report. Yes, that's, uh, yeah, that was the full, and that's within, the full rating. It's all those who watch the program within one week of transmission. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but yeah. That was, the, uh, that was Britain and America, so now we go on to the next, which I believe is uh, the Canadian ratings. Yep. They watched it up there in Canada, eh? Yeah. Hey, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. They only had 805,000 viewers. Must have been up against the hockey game. <laughs> It was the number one program on the day on all of television among the key, uh, I guess, okay, 25, Age 25 64, to 40, 18 to 49 demographics. Okay, I thought it was in general. And the most watched episode on their uh, their channel, Space, this broadcast year to date. Yeah, it reached nearly 1.4 million viewers overall. Hmm. Hmm. And they mentioned Twitter again. Because, yes, we get it. Doctor Who was big on Twitter that day. Yep. We get it. It's well, they, trending. They were, they were pimping it for Twitter. They had all this <laughs> hashtag stuff going on. Um, for, you know, it was, it was on BBC America when you were watching it. It was in the lower left-hand corner. It was, you know, I'm like, Jesus wasn't there, I think it was Day of the Doctor, where there was a, wasn't there a commercial where Matt Smith was going on and on about hashtags? Something like that. I found it ironic at the time, because we had just done that um, anniversary episode a little bit ago about, um, that was, um, or the anniversary, one of the... Um, oh, big yes, Babblesphere. Yes. So I found that suddenly very amusing. For the time... We'll, we'll, get, we'll get so trapped up talking on Twitter about Doctor Who that Tom Baker will have to come and save us. All of these work. Uh, that, that was uh, Canada, and then we have Australia. Um, <coughs> I just noticed the link there is overnight ratings. Let's see if it includes the regular ratings as well. If you can find them. Not a lot of Oh, the Dalek ratings. What the hell did I do? Oh, wow, yeah. Apparently nothing. <laughs> wow, what are you reading here, Bill? Uh, <laughs> wow. They I actually are... gets... <laughs> yeah, that's why they got the overnights. Let me go get the proper uh, deep breath Australian. If, you know, my browser will stop having a mind of its own. I guess it's trying not to be a soldier. I'm not seeing anything. Here, I'm about to link it now, and here we go. Oh, overnight Australian ratings for Deep Breath and Australians, and yeah, and Australian simulcasts will continue. So they're getting every episode at the same time as Britain, I guess, now. Based yep. on that headline, uh, Deep Breath had uh, 1.8 uh, 1.187 million national viewers, so that means more than Canada. These figures include the five major capital cities and as well as regional and rural viewers. Oh, Echo! Hello, Echo. Who's echoing? Mm -hmm. Okay, it stopped. I stopped the echoing. Yay! The, the 4.50 a.m. Uh, simulcast with the U.K. averaged 260,000 national viewers. So, that's a, that's a fair amount for 4.50 a.m. Yeah, considering the fact that they had to stay up till 6 in the morning to finish that. Yeah. Or get up at, like, 4. And that was international. That's on the other side of the international date line. So that would have been on a sun on a Monday morning. Ugh. Sunday morning. No wait. 
Yeah, it would have been Sunday morning. Sunday morning? Yeah. Okay, I did that wrong. Either way, still. Ugh. Now, mind you, I would do that, but I'm I'm not exactly, you know, yeah. a poster boy for sanity. Well, we 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 we, do, we take our sleep saw through standing cat naps. I don't know why I, I really said wish I could have last week. <laughs> <laughs> I could have right, last and, week. That was our, uh, I think our last the last thing I said news. before my head hit the pillow on Monday was I could see purple. Or, or I could taste purple. Oh. Wow. It was bad. And our, uh, our last bit of uh, into the of oh wait that was into the Dalek. Okay, so apparently I did not see a deep breath AI number. I don't know. Okay, so I guess into the Dalek has an AI number of eighty four. Let's see if uh, deep breath had one that I apparently missed because apparently I cannot tell title. <laughs> Yeah, you're you're constantly I'm, playing I'm, the I'm, into the Dalek with our I'm, deep breath. I'm clearly not titleist. I'm clearly not titleist. I'm gonna check the rest of these to make sure they're right. The Robot Sherwood is, trailer. And Pierre I'm Capaldi. Sure somebody would have noticed if other. Uh, AI... Okay, deep breath. Here we go. Here's the deep breath AI, which was eighty-two. And you just posted us the overnights again. What the? Okay, that's. You just posted the Australian overnights just, again. Yes. I'm, wow, Bill, what are I, you doing? I, I, no, I, I don't know why I did that, but I right click, I, I clicked it properly. I blamed the computer. <laughs> I blame the previous chancellor. I, I, I've seen your computer, Bill, and I can believe it. <laughs> Actually, oh. yeah, now that you, I happen to think of that. Oh, oh my. Oh my. So was it Deep Breath had an 82, and what did we just see into the Dalek have? I think also an 82. 84, I think. Was it? Oh, no, into the Dalek had an 84. 84, okay. Yeah, so it's marginally better according to their appreciation numbers. Hmm. Yep. Interesting. And I can I can believe it because I'm pretty sure the general buzz has been that Into the Dalek was liked more than Deep Breath, for you know for what each of them were. Yep. Yeah. Sorta. Of. All right, and our uh, last bit of news uh, is uh, a return of Doctor Who at the awards. In this case, Peter Capaldi uh, won by GQ as TV Personality of the Year. I think it's becoming a um, tradition that the the new Doctor always receives award uh, an award at GQ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I meant, Matt, Matt Smith. Matt Smith won uh, Best Actor in 2010. Although I think his season might have actually happened by this time of the of that year. Am I wrong? What's that? What, what, it might have. It, it might have been. I believe that was 2010. Uh, yeah. And Matt Smith also won Most Stylish Man in 2011. So maybe maybe that's what Capaldi is getting next year. <laughs> I have to I say I like his coat. Well, then again, you look at what Matt Smith wore, and I, I, I wouldn't consider that award-winning for stylish. <laughs> Although no. the man did si did single-handedly bring bow ties back, bring bow ties back for a few years. He did borrow an outfit from uh, I'm trying to remember which episode was it. Was it uh, Delta and the Ban Bannerman? Fez and Mop. I don't Might know. Have been Delta and the Bannerman. At least Capaldi didn't steal his new outfit from a hospital. <laughs> now the, ne the next doctor will. <clears throat> it's gotta happen once it's in a while. It's become a tradition. Every, every second or third doctor has to. It, yeah, it wouldn't be the next one, it'd be the one after. Yeah. That's true, yeah, it was, uh, what, three? Three did it. Three, 
three, eight, eight eleven. Was there anything in between? I'm trying to figure that out. We don't know where nine got his. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, seven got his from the TARDIS. Six yeah, I got think four, five, and six all got them from the TARDIS. Yeah. Although speak, speaking of uh, speaking of uh, the twelve doctors out, but I have to mention, I've been sitting like for for uh, the past year, I've been wondering when we're going to get another black and white doctor outfit wise. If you take away the strange way that he likes to show off the underside of his jacket, we would have another black and white dress doctor. You mean you mean his tuxedo mask markings? Yeah. Yes. No, no, it's a jacket, not a cape. <laughs> you obviously didn't see those pictures circulating the internet, did you, Matt? What, the, the finger pointing? I have that. It's in our opening credits. Can't it be a capet or, or a jape? <laughs> All right. I'm just going to sit here so, with my face in my hand. Uh, so I think somebody might be doing a yeah. summary. Marketed. Yes. So we're done then? <laughs> we're done with the news. Think, yes, we're going on to the summary. Uh, does anybody yeah. want to do the summary? <clears throat> or shall I go ahead? I believe go I did ahead, the last one, so go ahead. <laughs> Alright. Alright, so we start out with a spaceship under attack by basically your stereotypical Dalek mothership that we have now seen in, like, every season since the first uh, reboot. It's calling distress, uh, calling for help, and doesn't seem to be getting any reply. Um, The pilot is a woman, and next to her is somebody who is in very bad shape, if not dead already. She sends out one final distress, and then there's a basically a huge explosion and she comes to in the console room of the TARDIS. She's by herself. Well, at least that we can see. Yeah, the person that was next to her is not there. And she then sees the doctor. She then promptly pulls out her gun and threatens him to take her back to her mothership. The doctor's not having any of this. She wants to know where her brother is, and by the doctor's insinuation, he didn't make it. He he was killed in the explosion if he wasn't dead already. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, The doctor refuses to do anything until she asks him politely, with a please, to take her back to the ship. He then proceeds to turn around and do so. And after dropping her off, they basically threaten to kill him immediately for knowing where they are. The lady manages to stop this, stating that he has a doctor, and they have a patient. The patient turns out to be a Dalek, and the Dalek wants to kill other Daleks. What do we then cut back to Coal Hill School after our opening credits, and we see Clara and new person Danny Pink. Danny Pink is busy drilling a lot of the boys out in the yard before he comes in and starts his class. Some, one of the students interrupts his class by asking if he's ever killed anyone. He responds, yes, he's a soldier. He's, killed, he's had to kill people. They modify their question, has he ever killed anyone that's not a soldier? And he pushes that off to the side and assigns homework. Shortly thereafter, he's introduced to Clara. And they, start, they try to start a dialogue. I do say try, because Clara makes a couple of gaffes that hurts Danny's feelings, mentioning... After he mentions he's the more modern type of soldier, she jokes that, you know, as he's the kind that shoots people and then cries about it, he seems to take umbrage at this. Um, Clara then tries to invite him out to a party, and he um, basically says no and pushes it off. Afterwards, he's regretting this, though we are seeing both her asking and his regretting it simultaneously through directorial management. But Clara's there, overhears his regrets, and manages to talk him into going out with her for a, for a night. Clara goes back to uh, uh, one of the side areas of the school and bumps into the doctor, holding coffee. 
she mentions that he had sent him for coffee three weeks ago in Glasgow. Doctor says he can get he can get distracted by things and motions are to come, and we go back to the ship, where they are prepping to fix this Dalek. The way they're going to fix this Dalek is they're going to send a team miniaturized inside the Dalek casing, find out what's wrong, and repair it. This already seemed like a remarkably bad idea to me, but they continued on. The doctor didn't seem exactly thrilled either, but was going through with it. So the miniaturization works without anybody dying. They go in through the eyepiece, oddly enough, after a few uh, 60s-ish trippy effects, they wind up inside the Dalek, who the Doctor promptly renames Rusty when he's talking to it on the inside. He points out the memory vault, the Dalek's basically backup brain, which I think was established in the previous season. Um, he then looks down, and you can see the various what looks like cables stretching through the Dalek, through the... Uh, innards of the Dalek, and the doctor notes that not all of those are cables. Some of them are tentacles. Shortly after saying this, one of the soldiers, realizing they have to go down there, fires a grappling gun down into the Dalek to uh, essentially slide down on. This turns out to be a very bad idea as it triggers the antibodies inside the Dalek. Uh, the doctor tosses the man something, and the man, hoping that would save him, swallows what seems to be a small pill, but is actually just a spare battery from the doctor's sonic screwdriver. And the doctor has no intention of saving the man, instead to trace where they send his remains. Because feeding tubes are apparently unguarded. So after doing this and dealing with the angry repercussions of the surviving members, the doctor crawls through the feeding tubes, uh, finds a bolt hole, literally, and crawls into the innards of the Dalek. While this is going on, they ask, why? Why did the Dalek change his, his mind from being a standard Dalek to being somebody that wants to kill the other Daleks? And the answer is, he saw beauty. He saw the birth of a star and realized that resistance was futile and that the Daleks had been going about everything all wrong. So the doctor carries on and they notice as they're going on that their Geiger counter is spiking because apparently the Dalek is suffering a trionic radiation leak. The doctor goes deeper in to the point where the maximum discovers that the Dalek's trionic battery is leaking badly. He fixes it and as a result the Dalek promptly reactivates and goes through the standard Dalek mantra, powers up its weapons and starts killing humans. When the, everyone asks what's going on, the doctor says he tried, it didn't work, all they had done was fix the broken Dalek, and now they have a Dalek. Clara goes off and slaps the doctor for this comment, and talks him into thinking, well, if they had a good do Dalek once, they could do it again. So the doctor thinks about it for a moment, but the problem is they're now at the bottom of the Dalek, and to change things, Clara, at the very least, needs to be at the top. And the doctor needs to be with the, with the mutant itself. One of the soldiers that had gone with them sacrifices herself to get Clara and uh, the soldier we first met. Does anybody remember her name? I can't remember. Blue. Journey Blue. Oh, Journey. Blue. Journey Blue. Blue. Journey Blue. Right. Yeah. So gets Clara and your journey to the top of the Dalek, where Clara begins to start reactivating portions of the memory vault, which had blocked, blocked the memories, to the Dalek mutant. Meanwhile... The doctor crawls up to the mutant and starts engaging him in conversation. As they go through, Clara finds the memories of the exploding star at the doctor, hooks himself up into the Dalek's memories, and the Dalek sees the star again and sees things from the doctor's perspective. It sees beauty, divinity, and hatred. It turns him back to destroying the other Daleks. While, this was, while the Dalek had been attacking the humans, it had sent a message to its fellow Daleks who were now attacking the ship on force, pretty much Star Wars A New Hope style. The Dalek then turns on them, killing the, the Daleks that were attacking, but uh, deciding he must return to the, to the ship to 
get rid of the remaining dollars. The doctor, who had been hoping, after Clara's talking to him at the bottom, that they could turn this into a good moral Dalek, has realized the best they could. This is the best he could deal with that he can get out of this Dalek, and they leave the Dalek as fast as they can. Um, afterwards, um, he had said the doctor said he had hoped for a good Dalek. The Dalek said he is not a good Dalek that the doctor would be a good Dalek. And thus said, he, he travels back to the Dalek mothership and blows it up, causing a self-destruct. The humans are safe, and the doctor makes a swift retreat back to the TARDIS. Journey tries to accompany Clara back to the TARDIS with the doctor, but the doctor says he might have considered it if she hadn't been a soldier. Thus said, the doctor brings Clara back to the present, where she then t takes Danny Pink out for said dr for said drink. End of the episode. All right. Wow, we have an hour and a half to do discussion. Thereabouts. Actually, let me double check on that a little bit here. Yeah. <clears throat> um. Actually, that's right. We're gonna have to cut off a bunch from the front, anyways. Oh. But anyway, yeah. Um, actually, we should probably try to wrap this up about thirty minutes earlier because uh, we lost some bit of our footage last week. Oh, it's not th that, but uh, we have to literally cut this we at the two-hour mark. Exactly. Well, yeah. Otherwise, I mean, uh, Twitch is gonna be uh, giving us multiple parts. Yes, but it wasn't. We still lost some of our footage last week and should go over that either at the beginning of this episode or the end of the, or the end of it. So, mm -hmm. okay. Well, I, I'll well, actually probably if I have to alone, even I'll we'll cover the very end of the footage we are missing from last week. So wait, uh, Twitch cuts you off after two hours? Uh, uh, for uploading to YouTube, yes, and we'll uh, make a oh, multiple yeah, that's part. Right. Yeah. Exactly at the two-hour mark. All right, so, anyway, where are we going to start with this? Uh, I had a question. Yeah. Uh, I've only been into Doctor Who for, uh, like, uh, re recently. I haven't been a lifelong fan, but I've uh, been uh, into it long enough to ask this uh, question. The concept of a good Dalek, that... To me, it seems like it could be one of those uh, potential base-breaking things like midichlorians or an immortal killing another immortal on holy ground, uh, that that sort of thing. D just the very pre... Uh, um, depends we've, upon we've how they go about it. in the past, ever since, uh, I would say, 1967. <clears throat> Are you thinking of the human factor, Daleks? I am. No, we're 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 talking straight Dalek. No sure. mods. Mm. And no, in that case, there has never been a good Dalek. It's been an oxymoron. <laughs> Dalek. It was the Dalek with a soul in uh, 2007. That came across way too buffy, but whatever. Um, in 2007, what are you talking evolution, about? Evolution of the Daleks. Again, that's kind of a human factor yeah, challenge. you're right, you're right. Damn it, damn it. Okay, you're right. My mistake. You, you fail again, Bill. <laughs> no, no cookie. Well, that's that's how brainstorming works. No cookie for you. But no, um, Genesis of the Daleks showed us that basically Davros, who created them, basically removed all emotions from the Dalek except eight. Apparently, in doing that, he's also managed to leave fear because there's obviously the Daleks fear the Doctor on some level. But there's, you know, basically they were built to be ruthlessly evil. So the, the concept of good Dalek is an oxymoron, and that's kind of the Doctor's perspective throughout most of this episode, is you can't have a good Dalek, it's not possible. Although I, I kind of like the Dalek's response to that is like, no, you're a good Dalek. And that that is a line that has been discussed because it can go either way. It can either be read as 
the same thing that Dalek was saying to him in Dalek, where he would make a good Dalek because he's capable of that sort of, you know, single-minded hatred, even though he only focuses it toward two species that I can think of, whereas it can also be read as saying, no, you're what a Dalek whose moral alignment was good would be. See, I thought that too, and Rand said no, he thought it was how it was read during the Dalek, so it's nice to know that was, it can be read both ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it's, very I easily could. Yeah, he, does, he, does, he does say you are rather than you would make or you would be, so that's, I think, worth noting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, my reaction on it was based <clears throat> on the Doctor's immediate reaction to that line, which was he immediately had to withdraw to the TARDIS. Mm -hmm. He didn't seem to take it as a compliment. He seemed to take it almost well, in even, the same way Eccleston took it back in 2005. Yes, but even, you know, if, if you were told, no, you're, you're, you're what a, a morally good Dalek would be, that essentially means that you're a cockroach who's good. You know, you're, well, a cockroach that kills everything but also doesn't die. So maybe not a cockroach at all. But... Either way, I wouldn't. I don't think. You know, like if you said that differently, that would have been a great eleventh Doctor line. Yeah, it would. <laughs> but yeah, I, I see what you mean. It's I. It's just hard to tell because my my thought is the reaction. It's he, he takes it as if it was a very negative comment. Well, that's the action. usual Doctor's thinking, though. Is that he yeah. thought one way, but it could definitely be read multiple different ways. That, and the, the Doctor was kind of depressed from, you know, the past few minutes anyway. So he wasn't exactly in a, in a you know, even a compliment that he would like to take, and he wasn't exactly in a state of, in a state of mind to take it as a compliment. Yeah, I, I think, I don't know if it's going to come up again, but I, I, I think we'll see. We would have to wait and see, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to, I'm not going to buy it as a compliment yet. So, alright, what else do we want to talk about this episode? Well, and in, in talking about the Dalek, we skipped the fact that we have a brand new recurring character, possibly companion, uh, in this episode. Possibly, yes. <laughs> with, with the um, wonderful name, last name of Pink. Yep. Yep. Millions now, of trouble before who's the next soldier? Armor. Now, I'm going to ask you. You know how how horribly. Um, uh, they will riff on somebody in the military. Imagine if you were in the military with a last name like Pink. Yeah. Imagine what your drill sergeant would have come up with on that. <clears throat> you gotta be. You better be the most bad. You better be the most badass guy in your entire platoon. Mm. <laughs> I'm not sure that would even save you, man. Well, if, if if people are scared to make fun of you, then less people will make fun of you. Still, it's not going to stop a right. drill sergeant. Yeah. Now, granted, I don't know all that much about the British Armed Forces, so... I'm pretty sure I, they're no better honest, than ours. I don't know that no, much. No, I'm saying, yeah, I wouldn't say drill sergeant. I'm saying from in general. Like... Basic training only lasts a few months. It's not your major concern unless your name is Gomer Pyle. Pyle! All I remember is, I think, a bit from Monty Python's The Meaning of Life. Today we're going to be marching up, up and down, down this square! square. <laughs> Stop looking up there like you haven't seen the hand of God before! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <coughs> so many good lines. And I think it less to you like to go out and see the pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, all of you go. <laughs> <laughs> D 
just just the drill sergeant marching up and down the square. <laughs> Matt obviously knew the reference. Okay. Um. So. Uh, Danny Pink. What do we know about him? He was a soldier. Uh, he might have killed an know, innocent we, civilian. We yeah we we know that you know you 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 shoot people and then cry about it later involves remarks about what did he say either I didn't think anybody knew or I didn't think they told anyone something like that. Mm -hmm. So obviously something happened in his past, probably related to killing somebody he didn't intend to, do, and it. I would guess it probably caused his retirement. Case of mistaken identity, maybe. Or something of the like, yeah. Yeah. Or innocent bystander caught in the crossfire or something like that. Yeah, we don't know. It will probably be revealed over the course of the series as they're making a rather big deal probably. about it. Mm hmm. Yeah. Or it'll just lead to nowhere. If um, we are talking about Moffat <laughs> here, yeah. Yeah, yeah but it, that's, it, it, it is a Moffat line. I'm pretty sure that scene was partly written by Moffat and added into the existing script. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I remember hearing somebody mention that um, by, that an and Stephen Moffat had been added last minute to the credits. I didn't. I didn't notice it myself. Did anyone see that? I what didn't. Was that? Realize, I would have to rewatch my copy Absolutely. on the. Sure. Actually, I have a copy open on my screen right now. Let me back up to the opening credits. Um, but yeah, that's the character introduction. That's pretty much, you know, that's what his character is based on. So at the very least, it's going to be referenced in some way, if not explicitly. Yeah, most likely. You know, that's that's just like, you know, Mickey's relationship with Rose was a keystone of his character and created something, regardless, you know, of Yeah, what but it at the same time, again, we are thing. talking about Moffat here. What the else ma the man who forgets to mention that Skyro came back. Oh, yes. It does say, Into the Dalek by Phil Ford and Stephen Moffat. And okay. I'm not sure if it's the... And I'm not sure if it's the background color, like the placement and such, based on the graphics... Or if my eyes are playing tricks on me, or if Stephen Moffat's name is actually a font size larger than Phil Ford's. Ouch! Just to just to fill his ego. It's it's hard to tell. I'd have to pull it into Photoshop to see. It. Well, you know, it reminds me of the latest Tom Clancy novels, where it's Tom Clancy such and such written by such and such and Tom Clancy. And you know that the such and such is the one that writ that did ninety nine percent of the writing, and Tom Clancy just glanced at it and said, "Okay." Mm -hmm. And who's making all the money off those books? Tom Clancy. Mm hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yes, but to, to be fair, that means that the set, the second person is probably making more money than they would have otherwise because of Tom Clancy's name slapped on it. That's also yeah. partially true. It's 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 like yeah, it's like when you throw Steven Spielberg's name onto a movie when he is too busy to actually have anything to do with it to sell it more, to sell more copies. Did Steven Spielberg Clancy died? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, not that I'm aware of. I thought Tom Clancy was the Are character myself. Are you talking so about... Um, I think Angel's right. Hmm. No, he died October 1st, 2013. Oh. Oh. Hmm. I missed it. Well, I missed it. <laughs> I wasn't in a I, I wasn't in a real good place at the time, so. October last year. Yeah, it was kind of chaotic. Every, all kinds of things going off all at once last I, year. No, I I I I pulled it up in Photoshop, and it was just a trick of the graphics that made Ford's name look. Smaller. He was near lighter things while Moffat had a straight black background, made it look bigger. Mm. But the Probably names are the same size. Because they had to paste it on after it was already done. Moffat had to go, wait a minute, wait a minute, why isn't my name on that? I'm not getting enough recognition. So that, means that, that, means, that means almost the entire season 
has an let's see we've got uh episode one by Stephen Moffat double double length episode two feature you know and Stephen Moffat episode three Gaddis which basically is and Stephen Moffat episodes four five and six are and Moffat he takes seven eight and nine off at seven eight nine and ten off and then has two scripts by himself at the end of the season three if you and we don't know Stephen Moffat won't have his name tacked on to seven eight nine by the time it gets there true. Because he could also be adding in stuff at, at random, too. <clears throat> yeah. Because I think the but, biggest part that he might be adding on to get the and Stephen Moffat is probably the uh, leaking, like, heaven stuff. stuff that, I and, think, well, I think the, the stuff with uh, Danny he probably got to do maybe. with. Maybe. Considering he, yeah, you know, he's the script editor, he has to have a lot to do with that. If he's actually doing um, his job. This if it's in there, Vampire yeah, Slayer, hopefully that means he's actually editing people's scripts. Which will this be a would mean that Vampire, This would mean that Vampires in Venice is the first companion intro that is not written or co-written on, you know, on screen at least by Stephen Moffat. And I think Vampires in Venice wasn't all that much to it anyway. So. No, it was kind of a forgettable I mean, episode. Rory had already been established. Yeah. <clears throat> he had he had appeared. I don't think he'd been established. We had he, met well, him. he was in eleventh hour for most of the episode. He he was established. We hadn't. Amy wasn't established until the beast below. She had appeared, but she wasn't established. We didn't know anything about. We didn't know what kind of a character she was until the beast below. <laughs> so I would not. Say you that mean there's development for Rory since when? He was always spineless. He was, he was badass for only one episode, and that was yeah, a Moffat if episode. Yeah, you're going by that as a basis, Bill, Rory wasn't established until the finale. <laughs> yeah. Which, again, might be why, which, like, might be why Stephen Moffat wrote uh, Danny's intro. Yeah. I... Yeah, but I, I am curious to see if all of this about, you know, the killing and soldier and stuff does go somewhere. I'm also kind of wondering why they have a cadet program for young children in this uh, in this school unless that's a British thing because I know it is a British US thing. It is a British thing. It is a British thing. Um, go back to um, human nature, family of blood. Yeah, I was just going to say. Yeah, but okay. <clears throat> that was the old version of it. That was also World War One, pre World, pre World War One time period. Mm. It was pre post Victorian rather than modern day. Edwardian. That was the Edwardian age. Gotcha. Yes. But, but yeah, um, that's been uh, uh, schooling kids to learn that kind of stuff. Has, as far as I, I am aware, has been a common thing. Yeah, it, it's it's a very common thing in England, and. Um, that kind of that kind of dealing in private schools hasn't changed that much. And this is and, technically a private school, I believe. Uh, technically speaking, all schools it's their, their their definition of public school and private school is a lot different from ours. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. The more you I, I know. I had to look this stuff up before, and it's um, it got me confused. Ah. I got confuzzled. Because by by the looks of things, their definition of a private school seems to be more of our like our definition of a public school, and vice versa. Weird. No sense. Yeah, that's a little odd. Anyone in the audience yeah. knows a little more about that? Feel free to comment. Um. Anyway, though, I mean, you know, it seems he seems to be. Um, well, the other thing we know about Danny Pink is he's pretty much um, socially awkward around women. A little bit, yes. Yep. Or at least around Clara. I don't think um, we've seen him around any other women. Well, he's 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 been around 
found that what the secretary or whatever the hell she is. That's right. Uh, he was very cool and collected with her, but it seems Clara was the one he started really regretting. What did you think about the the, the directorial style of having um, basically his his ruining how he how he handled the conversation with Clara and the conversation with Clara <laughs> happening simultaneously? I've seen it before. I don't mind that it. That was interesting. Yeah, I mean. It's I thought it was a, a very classic time travel. It's a very yeah. classic sitcom style thing, which is something that both RTD and Moffat have done a lot to bring to Doctor Who is sitcom and soap opera stylings to make it a bit more accessible to the mainstream compared to what it was in the eighties. Mm -hmm. uh, as to good or bad, I mean, I think it was carried out okay. I don't think it was, you know, the you know, I don't. I think it could have done without it, but I don't think it was hurt by that either. Okay. Uh, I think they should have gone a little farther with it so that it made more sense. Because it's, I think, the only scene I can think of in, in Doctor Who other than, you know, a suspenseful exposition. To do that. Whoa. Oh, we're losing so you. Think yeah, we're losing you in a horrible way. Just to, uh, oh, how, how much are you losing me? You completely blanked out for a second or two. You were we were getting uh, about every other syllable there for like half that conversation. So that okay, so I'm going to guess that when you were cracking up earlier it was my connection rather than either of yours. I was wondering about that. Quite possibly. Yeah, I'm hearing Matt uh, fine. What was the last thing? I you know I'm hearing say? Aaron fine because there's technically no internet between me and Aaron, just a wireless connection. Yeah. And I'm hearing Tim fine, so the only one I'm not hearing good is you, so it has to be your connection. Well. And just as you point that out, his connection completely bottoms out. Haha! -ha. Theory proven! <laughs> Crash! We've lost him! You you have forced the issue and we lost the bill. <laughs> yes. You see, Watson, I was correct. Oi. <clears throat> Let's see here. What time do we it's have just on to this? Just put a little more Sherlock Holmes back in our Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yes. Say, if Doc, if the Doctor became a cow, would he be Doctor Moo? Oddcon thought That's... so. <laughs> Odyssey Con, we went. We actually went to a convention where he there was a cow doctor and it was Doctor Moo. That was the theme for that year. Mhm. Mm for that convention. I believe next yeah. year is Zombie Survival or something like that. The Grazing it's, um, Dead. The Grazing, the grazing dead. dead. Oh, so that would be Doctor Goo. Yeah. It's it's not a glue convention. Okay. Am I bad? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of these of the various exist. possibilities for that, and I'm trying not to now. <laughs> <laughs> can yeah. you hear me now? Now we can, yes. Hello. Welcome back. We were talking about glue conventions. <laughs> yes. Dave's tall. Ah. Uh, this is what happens when I'm gone. <laughs> did, did the glue conventions come from something? Dr. Moo. A completely a, a side note by Tim. Combining cows yeah. with uh, ah. Doctor Who. But anyway, um, ah. So yeah, we don't know much else about Danny Pink at the moment, do we? Not particularly, no. The first time I saw Danny Pink on screen, I wasn't sure if he was human or if he was like one of those. Uh, alien fighters until I saw Clara because I wasn't sure like wh where we were alien uh, fighters my, the first thought through my mind is oh look we've got a new Ricky <laughs> you mean Mickey yeah I think I thought that too <laughs> I was just like oh look they're actually going to fully hopefully fully pursue an interracial couple Instead of, you know, splitting them up and having them be with same racial races. Hey, 
Amy and Rory were interracial. One of them was plastic. <laughs> <laughs> Only some of the time. Only some of the time, Bill. Not all the time. Yeah, they still had to create Melanie. Or Melody. And remember, the world restarted, so technically he wasn't plastic after the world restarted. But he could remember being plastic. Mm -hmm. Because everything had to be remembered, including the doctor. Mm -hmm. Although if they could remember him being plastic, wouldn't that have made him plastic? No, it just means that the memory of it was there. Yeah, I think so. And on the and on the next episode, Rory when Rory wound up back in time, he pursued a new career as Plastic Man. Oh, better than Stretch Armstrong. I I have to say, that Doctor Who is probably well, one of the primary shows where most of the men introduced are primarily a love interest to the character, rather than the other way around. And granted, that's. Okay, there is a bit of an issue where a lot of companions were a love interest to the male main character, but I think it's more the other way. Mind you, that's more of a new Who thing than a classic Who thing. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. I mean, you had Jamie and Victoria, but they weren't an actual couple. No. There was some tension between them, and I think also Jamie yeah, and Zoe. Like... Maybe. Ben and Polly was probably the one you can make the strongest argument for being a couple. After that, probably Ian and Barbara, then Jamie and Victoria. I, I would actually say Ian and Barbara are the number one. Yeah, I'm not sure if you could actually... They were pretty much together the entire time they were on the show. More than always. Ben and Ian, 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 and Bar Ian and Barbara were colleagues, <clears throat> whereas Ben and Polly, I thought, were clearly a couple when they came on the Tartars. I didn't think so. The, it kind of seemed like they were at least very enthralled with each other when they first got in the TARDIS. Uh, well, you also had to remember <clears throat> it was the 60s. Yes. It was the late 60s. The form of argument seems more like a couple than anything else. We got to see them quite a bit in that particular episode of The War Machines. I'm pretty sure they were a couple. If, if they weren't a couple, they were very close to becoming a couple anyway. I wasn't sure, because I thought... They hung out together they... for an entire night alone. <laughs> Again, it's the 60s. <laughs> I'm just saying. Did they beat in the bar? It was in the, the late sixties. In the war machines. Uh, my 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 judgment in those four. My yeah. my judgment in that, that was more based on their dialogue. They spoke like a couple. To at least that's how I understood it. They are they argued like a couple. Kind of okay. yeah. But. Well, you see, the thing that I'd always seen... I'm being paranoid. You're breaking up again, Bill. Mm. You really gotta do something about that connection, Bill. The thing I the thing I had seen about... Um, I was wondering because it, I was, couldn't... I couldn't tell it... <laughs> <laughs> there he goes again! Bye! <laughs> he goes Bye, again. Bill! But no, the thing about Ian and Barbara, I had always seen them as uh, two people that were attracted to each other in the workplace, but were denying it. And then, um, as they were thrown into this impossible situation, they learned not to deny it. Mm, they'd never really oh, said they were a thing, though. All yes. Doctor Who canon that we've seen thus far has established that they were still together years later. Hmm. They were mentioned in the Sarah Jane Adventures um, as one of the people that Sarah Jane had looked up that had been companions of the Doctor and that they were uh, teaching at a college, I believe, or had retired from teaching at a college. But they were mentioned together <coughs> mm. what's 
this? Uh, he's okay. Bill's gonna restart. <clears throat> okay. But yeah, uh, Ian and Barbara—they definitely seem like they could have the possibility of being a couple, but they never really had anything official pop up on screen. By the way, wh while I'm restarting, I'm gonna try to see if it works any better. Better just doing Skype through my phone. <laughs> no idea if it will or not. Well, no, you're, you're coming in clear possible. so far. Oh. Maybe you you will be okay. We've had meetings where we've tried to do that. That's not worked too well, but maybe it will be fine for you. It, it, he is trying to connect to the call, not actually host the call. Is also a major difference on that. Bucky's trying to chew on my earpiece, <clears throat> on my headphones. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, I don't you don't want him to do that because he's already destroyed one pair of your headphones. Not to mention if he gets an animal wire, but anyway. Besides Naughty Cats. Uh, should we move on, then? <clears throat> uh, yeah, I think we've said most of what we have to say about Danny, at least at this early point in his career. I'm sure we'll have more to say over the next few weeks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what's next? Um, okay, so we're, we're apparently now in the midst of another Dalek-Human war. Apparently. Well, at least we for this know, one, we this ended up is, in one. The humans, the humans are rebels, which stood out to me, because the only thing I can think of where the humans lived in territory occupied by Daleks, unless they're actually Thals that look like humans, uh, would be a Fifth Doctor audio that I listened to that came out a few years back, and I doubt that they were dipping that far into the pool for the sources. Yeah, um, I wouldn't think so. Did we actually get a time frame that this happened in? No. I don't recall. I don't think so. Uh, uh, my, <coughs> my guess, my guess, considering uh, the co-writer is 51st century. In fact, I, I would actually be shocked if this is not the 51st century. Yeah, the uh, um, uh, T TARDIS data core doesn't give us a. Uh, um, a time frame. Which is unusual. I would assume it's around the same time as the, uh, uh, constantly eluding fight with the, uh, Cybermen would be my guess, because these no, people were not, at least decently outfitted for fighting. Because I guarantee you, other than Cybermen, there's a lot of other nasty well, menaces there, the, you, that uh, other humans have to worry about out there. there. I think Bill's uh, going again. Well, they're, 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 they're rebels, so I imagine... The combined galactic resistance was an alliance headed by humanity to fight the Dalek invasion of the galaxy. But, again, doesn't give time. <clears throat> so, apparently, this is a actual front against the Daleks. Mm-hmm. So, technically, it's not just a human resistance. It's probably a multiracial task force. We just happen to have put them across one that's mostly human. Right. But, again, there's no time frame. <coughs> we know it's not the 21st century because um, uh, the, Do the humans hadn't left Earth by then, according to the Dalek invasion of Earth. Mm-hmm. You mean the 22nd but century, then? Likewise, I don't think it's the 51st century unless the 51st century has been rewritten. And if the 51st century has been rewritten, does Captain Jack Harkness still exist? All very good questions, none of which Moffat is concerned with. But, I guarantee you. We honestly don't know when this is. Um, we didn't get enough of an idea of technology to figure out when it would be either. Yeah. Um, so, time frame unsure. 
No reason um, to keep beating the horse on that one. We, it's they. It's just clearly not stated, and we have no sure time frame. It seems fairly grim, and they mention, of course, <laughs> that there that there are duplicates because um, they suspect the doctor of being one at the beginning. And that's something that goes back to um, Resurrection of the Daleks, the fifth that, Doctor. That's also something yeah. that the Daleks have been capable of. Yeah, it's been something that Daleks have been capable of for quite a while previously. It, it, it does, but it doesn't have to be at that same period of time because it's also something that, it's also something they used in Asylum. Yeah, it's also, in Asylum of the Daleks, they used that in the present day. Or they sent them back time traveling to the present day. Something sort of like that, yeah. It's weird. Asylum itself is weird. Yeah. Because you've got more like assimilated humans. Which they have used a, a couple more times since. Which still doesn't make that much sense. No. It would have been just better to make the du the humanoid duplicates. Why would you do something as silly as have a human with a Dalek thing sticking out of their forehead? It kind of makes them a giant I, target. I still say Asyl Asylum would have made a crap load more sense if they'd used Cybermen instead of Dalek. Yes, it would have. Hmm. A lot more sense. Anyway. anyway. <laughs> um, <coughs> Other than Bill so playing musical the rest, Skype. The rest of the, the, the episode kind of hits me as a hybrid of Fantastic Voyage and The Invisible Enemy. Um... And classic, and only classic Who people are going to remember what the the Invisible Enemy is. It was a Tom Baker episode back yep. during the era with Leela, in which um, uh, the Doctor is infected by this uh, microscopic entity called the Swarm, and he basically has to duplicate himself, miniaturize himself, and go inside his own brain to fight it off. Yeah. Oh, sort of, sort of like that episode of Futurama. Yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, you can probably bet the, that the uh, Futurama episode came after they watched that episode of Doctor Who. It's well known Quite that possibly. Groening and a lot of the other people that are behind the production of Futurama are Doctor Who fans. Yes, are, both you know, on Futurama on. and as well as on The Simpsons, they have frequently referenced the fourth Doctor. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right. So, so they're fourth Doctor fans. It's not surprising. So yeah, the worm episode probably stemmed from them watching the Invisible Enemy. There's too many similarities. And Fantastic Voyage, because you know, mm -hmm. that's Fantastic Voyage much was a thing. The story that started the whole miniaturization concept. I'm pretty sure that Doctor Who episode stemmed from the from the writers. Um, either reading or watching Fantastic Voyage. Quite possibly. Mm. Um, so that being said, uh, the miniaturization story, I think that worked out pretty well, although there's a few rather overly grim parts for no apparent reason. How'd the special effects hit you? I like the psychedelics when they first entered the dog. That was kind of amusing. Oh, yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> they entered through the eyepiece. Wouldn't that have been a solid lens? It seemed like they were going through, like, a really thick gel or something. Yeah. Hmm. Is what I got out of that, at least. Yeah. That's what they seemed. I mean, but, yeah, if you've always looked at Dalek eyepieces, they were always looked like solid lenses. I mean, for all we know, they, they may not have been. No, it's... It could just be that solid, that really thick gel that looks like a solid lens. And at the same well, time, you know, wouldn't you think it would have been easier just to pump them in through that frickin' grate, that that grill that's, you know... Around the neck? Headpiece? Yeah. Mm, depends on what's in there. Yeah, but then they wouldn't have been able to do that psychedelic uh, effect <laughs> moving through gel thing. <laughs> Oh, man, psychedelics, man. It was very 60s. Yeah. You gotta let the coolness in. <laughs> and as I mentioned at the beginning, um, then we get to see the memory vault, which was established in Asylum of the Daleks and had <clears> never <throat> heard from before. 
at but least the, we're at using it again. At least it didn't completely come out of nowhere this time. True. Although last we saw it, the doctor had erased it, had uh, Oswald, or was it Oswin? Whatever, erase him from the uh, entries in the vault. Does that mean he's actually back in the, the memory vault now? I think so, because he got re-entered during the, uh, during the fight at, um, what's it called? Ugh. God, my brain keeps hemorrhaging names, even names I should know by now. Um. Christmas. Time of the Doctor. Oh, uh, Trenzalor. The, 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 the 1100 years of Trenzalor. Yeah, the, obviously they have a huge backing up, not only from uh, personal people history, but also from their own experiences at Trenzalor. They should have more memory of him now. Mm-hmm. So the Doctor tried to erase himself from history. Didn't work! Didn't work! He wanted to take he a break. Didn't happen! Tried to erase, he tried to erase himself from history two or three times. Yeah, it never works. It, it, they keep throwing that as often, as often into our faces as they do trying to kill the doctor. Moffat, come up with something new. The doctor can't hide, and I he think, also isn't going I to die. He, I think he tried to do it in the R2D era a couple times, but it was, it was a little more subtle. <laughs> Iris wants to wipe out all reference of him. <clears throat> And it was apparently used because somebody tried to access information on it before and it was uh, corrupted because of something called the bad wolf virus. Ah, yes. A but, virus, uh, I believe, the doctor himself created. Yeah. The doctor is not bad. Well, unless bad wolf created it. No, no. He actually left the virus with Mickey to try and wipe out all information about himself. I'm trying to remember when he did that. Uh, that was the end of uh, World War Three. Mm. Mm. So it was during the cycle. Therefore, the name of the virus itself probably got corrupted by Bad Wolf. Probably. But regardless, apparently, um, although the Doctor did seem surprised when the when the the Dalek immediately said Doctor in the uh, way very akin to how it was done in Dalek. But his thought was, how do you know who I am? I wasn't sure if he was meaning with this face or at all. So, I would assume with that face, because that face is relatively new to all of this. Yeah. But then again, the second face the Doctor wore, the Daleks already knew who he was when he met them, too. So. Well, they kept throwing out his name, so obviously they linked everything together themselves. <coughs> I, I had a couple of beefs with the doctor's behavior in this episode. Yes, as the, uh, which was what I was starting to go to as well. D okay, what were your beefs? Let's see if they match my beefs. W WTF with the tossing that battery to that guy and making it yes. look like he's going to help him. Yes. That... It was so against the way the doctor has acted every time we've seen him before. That's something even the Sixth Doctor would look at and go, what the hell's wrong with you? Yeah. And, you know, it's... I, I, I understand if the Doctor, you know, couldn't save him, but would at least say that, I'm sorry, I can't do anything. Yeah, he would at least try to apologize profusely before even trying to dump something like that on the guy. Yeah. And even I if think he, tells, he I think you know, I think what he said instead was trust me. Yes. Yeah. See, I think it's all leading up to something, but that's just me. Oh, it so might be. It I might be, but like I, I think I mean yeah. I think there's also the part of it is that there's been a running theme throughout New Who and possibly even older that the Daleks bring out the darker side of the Doctor, and that might be what we're seeing here as well. I'm also, kind of thinking, and... I'm also kind of thinking at the same time that the first Doctor was very 
unattached to his human companions, and this could be another bit of it too, since this is the very first regeneration of a new cycle. Either way, though, you would think, you know, having 2,000 plus years of knowledge behind him, that tact would have at least have a little bit of, of factoring in here. Well, and also, instead, he's he very new to this fight, yeah. He seems to use the old standby of, trust me, I'm the doctor, mm -hmm. and then kind of rescinds on it, and that just hit me as very, very wrong. Yeah. But yeah, it does does come off as very wrong. Now, later like... on, there's another scene where somebody is going to die, and the way that one's handled is almost textbook doctor. Yes. Mm -hmm. That one was a little bit better handled. The, the, right. the woman obviously knew she was going to die for this, and she just wanted to try and hope for the best, despite what she knew was going to happen to her. And there you there you see the remorse, and you see the caring that you expect from the doctor. Almost as if they're two different writers. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Which, which wrote which? I really Good just question. want it to be you know, something that has to do with maybe the Doctor turning evil, although it's kind of a fan fiction-y concept. It is. Having the Doctor do a face-heel turn, um... Well, then, 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 then the, the Time Lords can go back at the end of the season and put him on trial against himself. Yeah. We could do a the rehash is... of Trial of the Time Lord. Oh, hey, Colin, like that Colin... really did well ratings-wise before. <laughs> Colin hey, we'll upgrade it. It doesn't Col stop them from rehashing crap to begin with. <laughs> Colin would get to come back for an episode. Woo! Troll face! <laughs> Introducing Peter Capaldi as the Valiant. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. What would be freaking awesome? If they did bring Colin Baker for back for an episode, if they brought back the Time Lords, as his original character he played in Doctor Who. Oh, oh, as that um, would be pretty cool. As uh, oh, what's his face? Uh, Maxil is it? Maxil, yes. Mm -hmm. Bring him back as again? Maxil to have him shoot the doctor again. The more things change, the more they stay the same. <laughs> it would be an awesome moment, and it would be even funnier if they still have the helmet. <laughs> if they bring back Maxil, who would now be, of course, like General Maxil or something. <coughs> yeah. And you just see Capaldi stop and look at him. It's like, that's where I got that face. <laughs> and then Maxwell just looks at him very confused. No, he'd like he'd turn. He'd be like, "You, I know you. I've seen your face somewhere before." Matter of fact, I think I shaved it. Ooh. <laughs> It'd just be a wonderful side reference, especially since they seem to be referencing from Deep Breath that um. The, where where um, the twelfth doctor got the idea for his face was right. the guy from Pompeii, of course being played by the same actor. Yada yada yada. It would have just been one of those side act, side references where we've seen it before, and him go, oh. And then and then Lala War just walks across across the screen silently, <laughs> smacks Capaldi upside the head, and walks off. I would pay to watch that, to be honest. <laughs> that would writing something like that would give Moffat way too much credit. Of course, Moffat could be listening right now and trying to steal our ideas because he does that from the if internet. If he does, he's welcome to if, it. It'll be an improvement, Moffitt, I'll admit. <laughs> if Moffat's listening right now, why hasn't he started using ideas before? <laughs> Well, he steals yeah, everything I else from the internet lately. ideas over our 70 episodes. If you ever stumble <clears throat> across our podcast, Stephen Moffat, and you're still writing Doctor Who, you're welcome to any idea I've said, if it's still relevant. As long as it fixes your really, really sloppy stuff right now. <laughs> yeah. If it gets you out of way to writing something with continuity and logic... There's a word, logic. It doesn't just apply to Star Trek. Yes. Logically, sir. There's logic in his words. 
<laughs> There's logic in what he says. <laughs> oh, Linkara reference. Which, in and of itself, is another oh, Doctor oh. Who reference. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, the right. Cybermen. I love you, the 1980s Cybermen. So that takes us to the Doctor doing the awesome thing to try to get the Dalek to remember all this. And to be honest, that little special effect binge, having seen the leaked black and white episode, I liked it better in the leak. Hmm. Oh, actually, before we go on to the effects, I do want to say uh, someone had mentioned to me that this episode really made them interested in the 12th Doctor. Uh, well, Eli, uh, who used to be one of our co-hosts here and might occasionally yeah. stop by. Um, and I was sitting here like, I don't, you know, I don't really feel it. But then after re-watching part of this and re-watching specifically this, the opening scene before the credits, I'm like, okay, re-watching that scene, I can actually start to really get behind him because that actually, I don't know, I really get behind him in that scene. Just, you know, his whole attitude with, no, no, don't say it like that. Not and like I, that. Yeah, I like that bit. Yes, really that, like that, that was a really good bit with him, yes. I like the bit. Where Jeez. the person's going to sacrifice yeah. herself, do something, do something amazing in Name It For Me, and mm. I'll do something spectacular. And that's just perfect. Oh, that know. too. Those two scenes are the two that stand out the most to me in this. Mm -hmm. I don't know, what stands out the most to me is the scene where Clara slaps the doctor. <laughs> that too. Yeah, that that's, is that's, kind of a that's, You just want to get that five second bit and just loop it repeatedly. That's, don't that's, you? that's, that's, that's a popular scene. <laughs> Yeah, prepare for prepare yeah. for um, somebody like Nash to make a loop of that. Smack, 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 smack. I can watch this like all day. Smack, like smack. Robotech and Necros fans taking that scene where Rick smack slaps Minmay and do it repeatedly. <laughs> oh, Rick! <laughs> I'm waiting for it to become a meme. Every time the Doctor says something stupid, someone will play Clara slapping him. <laughs> that means by the end of the series... Freaking Capaldi's face is going to be as calloused as Larry Fine's. <laughs> you don't know who Larry Fine is? He was one of the Three Stooges. Yeah. Oh, you know, Larry Curly? He was Larry. Yeah. Well, I thought he was Mo. Aww. <laughs> and as a side on that, if you ever hear somebody in a in a comedy bit, like an intercom going, Dr. Howard, Dr. Fine, Dr. Howard. That's referring to the Three Stooges. Yeah. Oh. Mo Howard, Larry Fine, Curly Howard. And yes, Mo and Curly were brothers. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Anyway. That aside done, we go back to the episode. And yeah, like I said, I saw the leaked black and white episode. And to be honest... There are very much parts I liked on the leaked black and white episode. I liked better than the actual aired version. Like hmm. a deep breath. That scene was one of them. All the scene where the Daleks attacking other Daleks. I'm going to be keeping that leaked version just to watch that scene again and again because it is so... You feel like it's the 60s again. Mm -hmm. yeah. You well, watch as the, as, the, as the gun fires... But you don't see a laser beam come out. You just see a little glow on it, and then you see a glow happen on the guy, and it goes black. <laughs> oh, they actually did a gl reverse glow on the guy for the black and white original. For the, for the work print. Mm -hmm. It was great. It was it was back to the sixties again. That that is an amusing thought. You know you that know what I said about you know, deep breath when I saw that. You you know we're a certain type of fan when we enjoy watching the work print more than the actual episode. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the practical effects in the work print. Yeah, practical yeah. effects all the way, baby. Uh, I'll ha you'll have to borrow me that copy then. Um, <coughs> and also, you know, some of the music that they chose was obviously chosen by the writer and the director as to give Murray Gold a hint of what kind of thing they wanted yeah. to do. Murray Gold didn't apparently always listen. No, like, he didn't. Deep especially breath. in Deep Breath, he didn't. Hmm. Even here, um, apparently Murray Gold doesn't chose, have bagpipes. Where the Doctor linked into the Dalek, what they had chosen to show was the end bit and music from 2001 A Space Odyssey. <sighs> you know, the part where Kubrick gets really, really trippy. 
David Bowman goes into the monolith and apparently drops acid. Because and inside of a dog brain. Our multicolored spree, and you've got the the, the, the monolith chorus in the background going. Yee, yee, yee. It's and it's and it had that black and white version of that trippiness going on in the background of that, and that almost made more sense than what they did show. What what what? Not what they showed was particularly bad. It was just kind of generic and actually kind of a letdown after the work. It was, it was just a general shot in space, right? Yeah, it showed like a few space shots. <laughs> oh well. So now they know, as long as they pay attention. If if the special effects were still being done by the mill, that would have been awesome. Probably would have oh, yeah. been yes. Mm -hmm. They really do need to go back to the mill. The mill was doing such a better job. I think the mill raised the prices. Still, you'd think they'd be able to afford it by they, now. They, they, they need to take more money from British license holders. Yeah. And, it, you know, I really wish we had the work prints for the further episodes because, yeah, I would have loved to see what music stings they were taking for some of the upcoming episodes. But thus far I have not been that thrilled with Murray Gold's tracks for this for this series nothing has really stood out to me as being yeah I can't say I didn't notice anything stand out in the music either as of yet I mean um, we might have gotten spoiled because Murray Gold hit I am the doctor right in the 11th hour and everybody fell in love with it yeah pretty much and I haven't seen any particular music after two episodes, that stands out to me going, this is the most awesome music ever. I mean, for the, during the Tenth Doctor era, we had This Is Gallifrey as, you know, probably one of the best songs that came out of that era. One of the better ones, yes. And then we had I Am The Doctor during the Eleventh Doctor era. And what do we got now? So One far, the just the same old. The failure, they'll find some way to make I am, put I Am the Doctor back into the music. Well, next week we should get music. We should get singing. Oh, we better get some real music next week, yeah. Well, we'll, we'll, yes, we'll but getting... is it going to be any better than We're Men? We're Men. Yonder on the phone. Actually, now we know what our opening for next week is. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> That'll be easy to put together. Just give me about, Master say, half that. an hour. Sure get that. Give me about half an hour with that music and some of the footage from the episode, I, and we'll be done. I thought I thought you guys were going to sing. <laughs> we could. I don't okay. know if we'd have anybody ever watching this podcast <laughs> ever again afterwards. Yes. <laughs> so I'm sorry, we my, it's my best songs not are to. apparently restricted to reggae. We need to do the reggae, man. Hey, it's a doctor, man. By the way, man, we've got about 20 minutes. We're going into the Dalek. Okay, then. Uh, is there anything else we want to talk about in particular for this episode before we go into final thoughts? Um, well, I, I did not see the work print yet, but for what it was, the, the fight sequence was pretty decently done. I think we can talk briefly uh, on the... Uh, the if only you weren't a soldier thing. Yes. I, mean, I, I think mm. we've seen a little of that sentiment from the doctor before, but never to this extreme. Yeah. He never said that bluntly. I mean, yeah, he's never I mean, gone blunt with it before, more, but this was definitely a standout. The I mean, best Jamie, wasn't Jamie a soldier in, like, the Scottish War? More yeah, like he was a civilian... Though. More like he was a civilian caught in war. He had no, no real choice in the matter. He was a conscript. Uh. There's a difference between being a a a by and by soldier and being a draftee. Yeah, he's kind of forced into it. He didn't really have much of a choice. They, not many of them had, at that time had that in choice. Jamie's defense, and really in defense of Journeys, Journey Blue as well. In Jamie's defense, the British were attacking the Scot were attacking Scotland at the time. So he was fighting to protect his home. And so was Journey. I think the problem is 
Journey, I think the doctor saying no was from Journey's immediate first reaction upon seeing the doctor was to draw her gun and demand in the name of the military that he take yeah. her back to her ship. Yeah. I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of wondering if this sudden, like, extremism in that way is due to the fact of the memories of the Time War being brought back after, you know, the day of the Doctor and everything, and he's thinking of, you know, his war persona again and kind of upset that he made that decision to become a soldier in Night of the Doctor and remembering all that and wishing he could take that back. Maybe, but I don't think so. I think that's reading too much into it. Yeah, that's going a little... That's stretching I, I, a bit for it, always had a look down on the military. I mean, sure. even if you take a look at probably the way he was operating during the war, he was never really officially part of Gallifrey's defense force. No, he wasn't. He was operating on his own against the, against the Daleks. Mm -hmm. He was fighting the war, but he was fighting the war by himself. He was doing so it his way. A soldier, he chose to be a warrior. Again, there might be a subtle difference there. I don't oh, know. Yeah. Oh, he did, he did say warrior? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's right. He did say warrior. Yeah. yeah. Might have been warrior. But, either way, um, the Doctor has always looked down on the military. You see that especially during the Seventh Doctor era. Yeah. You also see a bit of it quite but often in the Third Doctor it, era. Yeah, I'm like, you see a quite a bit that talking down the military. Right. And then in Battlefield, when he has to deal with Bambera, he begins to be frustrated over the closeness of the military mind. So that dislike for the military has always been there. <coughs> in the Third Doctor era, the impression was pretty much that the military were stooges getting in the way of doctoring. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's always been there. The thing is, Capaldi's more of a blunt ass on it. Capaldi. Mm -hmm. By the way, uh, something else to note, uh, I actually found very good pictures for this. Um, the outfits for the military uh, group, uh, they actually have Arist Aristotle both uh, as arm patches, but also on their comm devices and on their guns. Very nice. So they actually went to the full length to actually label these people. Very so you nice. could probably find them out later if they pop up again. Okay. Anything so else cool before final out. thoughts? Uh, I think we're good. Okay. And then I will do final thoughts going as they as they are shown on my screen, starting with Tim. Tim. That's me. Well, yes, that's well, my final thoughts was... I was into this episode. I uh, liked uh, the trippy special effects. It was very retro. Retro. I uh, thought uh, it uh, had some good moments. Uh, some interesting philosophical questions uh, about uh, changing the nature of things versus, you know, like, uh, like we can't change who we are, we can only change how we uh, focus things, sort of. Like if, like if we're computers, like we can change our programming, but we can't change the software or the design itself. Self, mm -hmm. the, the questions, yeah, you know, like uh, the, the, do, the Dalek was always going to hate, it just had Found to a new change avenue. what it was going to hate. Mm-hmm. Eight, which I thought uh, is a good thing. So yeah, that that was my uh, my two cents. All right, Aaron. Hmm, I actually really liked this one. I actually kind of liked it a little bit better than the um, than the leaked version. Um, I guess just because I think it was decently atmospheric. Like I was afraid. Uh, when I saw the leaked version, that it was going to be kind of bare and kind of, kind of like Journey Through the TARDIS. I thought the sets were going to kind of look like that. And for me, uh, the sets were, you know, not to sound too superficial, but the uh, sets were kind of going to be the centerpiece of this, you know, of this story here. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, especially you know, the interiors. We've never seen the inside of 
they were they they played up about how we had never seen the inside of the Dalek, like just like we had never seen, you know, the the TARDIS, like you'd never seen it before, you know. So um, uh, I think they were able to pull it off pretty nicely. I mean, it was a little bit foggy and you couldn't quite tell a lot of what was going on. It was a lot, still a lot of tubing, but this made sense because a lot of it was supposed to be cabling and tentacles and all this other weird stuff. It felt alien and kind of cool looking too. I especially like the uh, centerpiece, the center tower. Or the oh control yeah. Center. Yeah, the yeah. big, the big open I, area. I thought, yeah. I thought that was pretty well done. Um. Yeah, I, I really kind of wish Journey Blue had been allowed to travel as a companion. I think she should have. She could have made a very interesting companion. You know. And it seemed like the the whole well we can't take you along because you're a soldier. It's I know it's kind of hard lined and that's how the doctor is, but it's just it felt like she was supposed to be more. So I'm hoping they at least have more stories, or maybe she's later on made a companion, maybe after she leaves the military or something like that. So or maybe before he like meets her in an alternate timeline and takes her along before she becomes a soldier. Um. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I felt like, the, the, like I said, the sets were good. I felt, I felt the story was halfway decent, yeah. I do kind of oh. like it better than Deep Breath. Mm -hmm. oh, never mind. I'll, I'll wait my turn. It's late enough. I can wait for my turn. Mm -hmm. Are you okay. done, Aaron? Yeah, I'm done. All right. Matt? I, uh, overall, yeah, I, th I think I enjoyed the story on this one a little bit better. Uh, I think it was a little less uh, piece-worked. Although there are still some hiccups here and there, I think there are a lot, a lot fewer hiccups than the previous episode had. Um, uh, the, 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 I think in particular there's some really offbeat writing for the Doctor in this one. There's some really good stuff, but then there's like the bit with the guy in the battery, which just kind of offsets you, upsets you and just goes, what the hell are you doing? Um... At the same time, there's a lot of other good writing going on. The uh, background characters are, at least at some point, used throughout the story. Um, <clears throat> uh, you can definitely tell they, they put a lot of time into the practical effects for this one, even if they splashed a whole bunch of digital all over it. The uh, Digital won't hold a candle if the practical effects underneath it aren't at least trying to do their job first. Is definitely been my feel on special effects, and you can kind of tell, especially with the multiple explosions and the huge fight between the Daleks and the humans, which we have not seen in a long time, that they were definitely putting a lot more effort into this one. Uh, also, I like the I like the uh, look of the uh, kind of ragtag Dalek. It's nice to see another dog that's kind of getting busted up again. And also, the nickname Rusty is uh, very apt for him. All right, you done, Matt? Yep. Okay, Bill? All right. Um, I keep forgetting to mention this, but who? Uh, I know Matt has. Has anybody else done extensive editing work, <coughs> like in terms of video editing? I, no. I've done a bit of video editing okay. for the Lounge Leads podcast. Most of okay, my editing so, has been done in script form. So so this this is mainly to, to Aaron and Matt then. Did the beginning, when it faded from the Dalek to the opening theme, did that piss anybody else off? Because whoever off. edited that Don't. should be ashamed. That was the to laziest me. bit of editing I have ever seen. I would have for, to go for back a fade, and anyway. see it. It that didn't particularly take anything off for me, that so... That was a very lazy fade. Like, <clears throat> uh, like I don't even remember... amateurish. I hate to say uh, it, but I don't even remember it, to be honest. I, I, I don't know. I think you like, might be reading into it too much again, Bill. From, from, where, from where the Dalek says yeah. you're a doctor to the music starting to play, and that just felt like something that a kid with Windows Movie Maker would do. I would yeah. have to go back and see it, yeah. Yeah, it didn't ring, really um, ring any bad bells for me, but other I don't than know. that, that was probably the most annoying part of the episode for me. And I, 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 I would think that's just a typical point to transfer. To be honest, I mean, yeah, it's a little too typical, but it, it was mm. lazy. It was not well done. Uh, other than that, I mean, this was an okay episode. It was written by someone who's mainly done 
essentially, you know, uh, younger audience spinoffs of Doctor Who, a little bit of Torchwood. Um, and it can kind of tell because this seems like, other than the new companion intro, that it's essentially, you know, a filler episode. It's there to, it has an, a romp idea that is kind of interesting on paper, not quite as interesting in the execution as it could have been, but it didn't annoy me in any way either. It was just, didn't really engage me in the way I would kind of hoped it would, uh, which isn't. Which does not make it a bad episode, but it doesn't make it a particularly good one either. Uh, and that's pretty much my final thoughts there. Okay, so... Um, thus far, this episode is scoring above deep breath on my list. Um, mm -hmm. I, um, I have basically now seen three versions of this. I've seen the leak, I saw the work at it, and I've seen this. Um... And when I read the script the first time, I, I had already established problem areas that I knew I had issues with, and those carried through to each edit. And it's mainly what we talked about, the doctor misacting. Yeah. Um, Don't know where that came from, but it could go back. Very strong parts in the script. Um, the later, the doctor reacting to the later death, um... There's some very good lines. Um, I care, or she cares, so I don't have to. Is a, a line I particularly like. Mm -hmm. um, the um, it's obvious that this uh, where the uh, concepts for this episode came from. It's nothing new to the uh, genre of science fiction, but at the same time, I thought it was done fairly well. Um, everybody I saw that acted in there acted fairly well. Um, other than the, uh, um, the, uh, timing cut with, uh, Danny talking to Clara, I thought seemed a bit out of place and confusing because again, it's not something that we've seen used before or probably again. Right, exactly. I've seen it yeah, a dozen times, so yeah, maybe it it's just used... me. No, but in Doctor Who, he means. Even in Doctor yeah. Who, it is... <laughs> I, I haven't not seen it used in Doctor Who before. And it, it just felt out of place. Uh, mm. But other than that, I've had um, this. Um, I, I quite like the majority of the script. It's like I said, it's obvious where they got the some of the ideas from Dalek, some of the ideas from Fantastic Voyage, and you know a, a few bits here and there. But still, it's it comes together pretty well for me. The sets are nice. The CGI is hit or miss. Again, I really miss the mill. Yes. Um, but where it's weak is not on any of the strong CGI scenes. It's little bits and pieces there. Um, a few things like uh, the screen as seen from Rusty, for instance, um, could have been done better. And it's places where what they have is passable, but if they had had a better CGI group done it, it would have shown. It would have just shined, and it's 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 you know kind of feels like a missed opportunity. But still, this is a fairly strong episode, and it doesn't have Jenny Vastra's tracks or River Song, so it's already scoring bonus points in my book. <laughs> so, uh, ratings. We'll start with Tim. I'm gonna give this episode a uh, a four out of five. And to put right. you on the spot, to put you on the spot, you weren't with us last week, so we want your rating for Deep Breath. Uh, Deep <laughs> Breath. Deep Breath was. Uh, I I didn't like Deep Breath very much. I'm only gonna give. Give that a three. Tied. Three. It's tied yeah. all the way through. That matches all of us and our live spectators. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. It, Everyone uh, thought it was uh, mediocre. I thought, uh, uh, P uh, Peter Cabaldi deserved a better story for his uh, pr his uh, first uh, full episode. Mm hmm Episode. And uh, for yeah. the guy, you said a 4.5, right? Yeah. And yeah, Into the Dalek is like a... I'm going to give Into the Dalek a 4. Oh, a 4, okay. okay. Yeah. yeah, he said 4 for Aaron? this one. I'm going to go with Into Dog, probably, oh, 
would give it. I would probably give it a four. Yeah. All right. A lot yeah. more enjoyable. Yeah. Um. I'm pretty much with them. This was a, definitely a more enjoyable episode. I'm not sure how long this one's going to stick with us, but it was definitely more enjoyable than the previous episode. And I can, and for being more enjoyable and a little more entertaining, I can totally forgive any other little tiny downfalls and one major screw up. So I say, yeah, it's it's averaging out at about four. Okay, Bill. I. I didn't like it enough for a four, but I did like it more than a three, so I'm giving it a three point five. Okay. Yeah. I've been wishing uh, watching between four I'm and three and a half. The majority of the panel on this and give it a four. Um, I liked a, a lot of it, and the parts I didn't like were short scenes. Yeah. yeah. Thankfully. You're, you're, you're agreeing with the majority of the panel. Yep. Yep. I, so think, it's, think, I, there's, I, there's, I think you're not far enough away from the con yet. <laughs> no. Are you saying a uh, panel of judges, you're saying? Yes. Our, uh, yes. Uh, I guess you could call us that. <laughs> We're giving ratings. It would be a review <laughs> panel. Picky, you know, picky, if this picky. was live, we'd be holding up signs. <laughs> That's what we missed. We should have had signs for the freaking pod. Uh, yeah. <laughs> For a live podcast. Oh, Matt, Matt was too busy throwing up in the corner. Oi, That's you don't need bad. to bring it back up. I don't I don't know <laughs> if I could take you seriously holding signs unless you were dressed as a panda. <laughs> I've nearly done that, Bill. If I had the money for the costume, I would have done it. <laughs> One year, about ten years ago, back when a back when the hotel that ASEN was in had a water fountain. I had a friend that was going to dress up as soon, and I was going to dress up as regular, regular <laughs> and going to sit outside playing shogi as they went in for a Ranma movie. And when they came out, I would have replaced it with a panda suit. <laughs> but anyway, so <coughs> four, 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 three point five. Uh, three point nine total. Three point nine. So this is above average. So that will do it for our podcast this this week. Um, we will, we're still searching for that day where we're all going to be able to do this. It's probably going to be Wednesday again next week, maybe? Yep. Most likely. All right. Depending on other yeah. people's schedules. <laughs> Tune in next week um, when we will be reviewing uh, Robots of Sherwood. Or is it Robot of Sherwood? We're still not I think it's Robot of Sherwood. Of Sherwood. And every time Doctor Who does a title like that, I'm going to have Matt's voice in my head saying it that exact Matt Smith's voice in my head saying it that exact way. Hey, well, mind you, like I've to... never had Matt Smith's You're voice after doing it because my because I originally replaced Matt's voice with Samuel L. Jackson. Hmm. Get these motherfucking tired. dinosaurs off my motherfucking yeah, spaceship. The thing. He, he was tired There's of the motherfucking robot on my motherfucking Sherwood. <laughs> Whereas Matt Smith was all excited about the dinosaurs on the spaceship. Word. These robots are my Sherwood. <laughs> anyway, tune in next week when we'll be discussing the new episode. See you then. See you all next time. See you.